Let me begin by thanking President Ilham Aliyev for his foresight in creating the Nizami Ganjavi Center and turning it under his purview and guidance uh, into a prominent platform where theoretical knowledge and uh, high-level political experience come together to discuss issues of our uh, current world. Uh, indeed, the uh, impressive list of, uh, of uh, participants is testament to the geopolitical role and convening power of Azerbaijan and of the uh, respect that President Aliyev commands among his peers. Um, to address your question on the subject of our uh, panel, let me <clears throat> very quickly refer to some definitions. Uh, alliances form in many areas, among them economic, political, as you mentioned. Um, but the most immediate association, obviously, especially when the word alliances um, uh, spelt with a capital A is military alliances. Um, alliances denoted uh, those uh, fighting in World War I uh, against the, uh, the Central Powers and in World War II against the Axis Powers. Um, perhaps a meaningful difference between alliance and its broader syn synonymic partner, as in uh, association or partnership, is that alliances inherently require an obligation to come to the aid of other members. Hence the famous quote by Thomas Jefferson, peace, commerce, and honest friendship with all nations entangling alliances with none. The same sentiment is echoed in a speech by John F. Kennedy on the US relationship with Canada, uh, where he said, geography has made us neighbors, history has made us friends, economics has made us partners, and necessity has made us allies. Now, Alliances, do they deter conflict? One would say that in the pre-nuclear uh, and nuclear age, yes. In the post-nuclear age, although nuclear weapons are very present, there are, the jury is still out, and uh, mercifully so. Um, very importantly, do the alliances require an antagonist? Because of their military association, alliances generally need an antagonist. What else, the argument goes, would motivate anyone to form an alliance with somebody else. Following this line, the UN itself can be described as an alliance given its, cannot, sorry, uh, be described as an alliance given, given its universal membership. On the other hand, if we define antagonist as global challenges, then the United Nations could, of course, and indeed should, be seen as the best alliance we have to act in concert uh, to advance our mutual interests. And this alliance has a, an, a terrific global roadmap. It's the Sustainable Development Goals that the member states themselves have adopted and Agenda 2030. <clears throat> this argument gains currency, um, uh, especially in now in our current situation where we're talking about multipolarity, but we're not even sure where we're going. We're just extrapolating from bipolar to probably multipolar. We're not there yet. We don't know where we're going. Um, but the UN in this situation could be the truly neutral table and the, um, and, and, uh, the truly global uh, um, alliance. But that's very problematic in our day and age because um, the key relationship between the largest players, the United States, Russia, and China, has probably never been as dysfunctional as now. A lot of the reasons for this dysfunction have been touched upon uh, in these past three days, three and a half days. Um, but one only had a cursory uh, uh, passing mention, which is nuclear weapons. And that is becoming a key problem. Uh, and the UN is front and center. You said well, how, how things change for the UN. Um, the UN seemed to have achieved many more things before the fall of the bipolar world than it is now. And uh, you know, for those of us who work in the Secretariat, we're hopeful that perhaps now that Russia has returned to its place in Western minds of being the boogeyman, 
maybe the United Nations, which for a certain period of time in the early 90s was accorded that role in the absence of the boogeyman, maybe now the UN can be used by its member states for what they created it, to be a place where problems that they cannot solve outside on a bi bi uh, partisan, I'm sorry, or, or bilateral manner can be uh, brought in and solved in the confines of the UN. However, uh, that is not happening, and what we're facing is a severe politicization of everything that the UN uh, machinery represents, primarily the Security Council, the Human Rights Council, and uh, the member states, instead of resolving issues, they bring their outside street fights inside the chambers, and they continue it there. So much so that we can't even talk about um, the P5 anymore, we talk about the P3 and the P2. And they don't resolve problems, they score points against each other. And one last thing, and I can talk about the disarmament afterwards if it's, uh, if it's of interest. Um, in conclusion, let, you, let me just make one simple but stark general point. If we are indeed in search of a new foreign policy, if yesterday's tools and mindsets are not able to resolve today's problems, they are downright useless for future problems. Thank you.